Welcome to Five Strike Weekly, everyone. This week, we take a look back at that unfortunate and frustrating loss to DC United, and we take a dip into the mailbag to answer some of your questions. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ, and this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become a member of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button. So guys, let's get into that 3-1 loss against DC United in what ultimately ended our eight game unbeaten streak and uh, super frustrating, of course, but uh, whatever it is, it seems like Bill Hamid just has some hoodoo over us and uh, you know, we just can't get more than one goal past him because you know, since I have back. no idea. It makes no <laughs> sense. I mean, you know, he. this is a guy that left DC United because he wanted to move up the food chain or whatever, and they bang yeah. on about it a lot during the match. And yet, he's back in MLS, which is frustrating, at least yeah. for us, because mm -hmm. like you said, it's like he's not very good when they play other teams. And all of a sudden, he's playing Atlanta United. Stands he looked really side. nervy to begin with, and then mm -hmm. now he's like making saves left, right, and center going down towards the end, and it's like, yeah. what the heck? Super annoying, because, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he wasn't a factor in our 3-1 wins at the Benz, but, you know, uh, of course, uh, when, when he's back, we uh, we can't we can't buy a win. It's ridiculous. I don't even think he's that good, so I don't know why it keeps happening. Yeah, it's uh, but uh, you know, the match started like it usually does for the five stripes. We you know control possession. We're circulating the possession around a parked defense, and uh, you know, uh, it, it all looks like we were gonna dominate. Uh, you know, kind of similarly to uh, the three one wins at the Benz, but um, you know, uh, just ridiculously simple uh, goal kick from Bill Hamid. Uh, lands on Rooney's, you know, head, and um, you know he's able to, you know, uh, lay it off to Luciano Acosta, who just really just, you know, blitzes our defense. Uh, and two against one, we uh, don't really have uh, an answer to it. Uh, you know, low rug burner and Guzan's beat uh, near post. I mean, that's uh, just something you don't really want to see. Um, you know. From our from our defense at all? Like no, that. no. I mean, it's honestly, it was an incredibly frustrating goal to give up. It's schoolboy stuff all the way around. Route one from the keeper, flicked on by a guy who is you know in his thirties, five foot nine, and he somehow jumping everyone. Flick on a header onto Acosta, who is just annoying on every level. It's like a little pest. He just, is so ugh. short, like he's so tiny, and yet he scores goals against us all yeah. the time. And he takes two of our defenders for a ride. They get made to look foolish, and then he catches Guzan, you know, leaning. And mm -hmm. Guzan should save that, in my opinion. Yeah. I don't know why he's so far forward when he's got two defenders in front of him. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We failed all the way around on the simple ball, and that was their first chance of the game. And then, of course, they're up one nil because yep. that's just how it seems to go when DC are involved. Right. Exactly. I mean, it was definitely against the run of play. We had, you know, a, a chance from Tito, a chance from Ezekiel Barco. Um, just really unlucky. We, you know, the symptom of this match is that we were not clinical and we couldn't put away any of our chances except for, you know, uh, a very, I guess, you know, lucky uh, Jeff Lerowitz who, yeah. Gets but, away uh, from Rooney and gets, and gets a decent yeah. header. And that, that was a good cross from, from Barco for yeah. the equalizer. So it was nice to see because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't go direct. And one thing Barco mm -hmm. can do is... Put a pretty flat ball in from a from a free you know from a set piece mm -hmm. free kick, and put it on someone's head. So with pace, and that that was what happened. He got he out jumped them and mm -hmm. got his fortieth goal in his career in the fortieth minute, no less. Right. So it, it looked like it was it was going to be getting better, you know, right. going into halftime. Yeah, we were growing into the game, uh, you know, and it's something that you know sometimes you just run out of uh, minutes in the in the half, and you kind of you know want it to just continue continue because you know we uh, we looked like we were going to. You know, maybe put another one in uh, because we were really dominating at that point. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, you know. it looked like Atlanta United hadn't really managed to get through the gears yet, get out of first gear. For like, well, really, minus yeah. the goal, they sat in first gear that entire match and mm -hmm. never could really get out of it. But you know, it's just like if they could turn the screw a little bit more, up the tempo a little bit more. And that was something that you know the color analyst uh, Stu Holden he saw, and you know, in in the early uh, first half, where he's like, man, this game's being played at a walking pace. Like yeah. it's being kicked so slowly around and that may have had something to do with the pitch but it's like this yep. game is being played slowly and yep. it was being played it, it felt like a home game away from home but worse mm -hmm. and there was just no zip to any of United's passing but it's like you could tell United or Atlanta United were the better team mm -hmm. like they were the dominant team they were better in every facet of the game mm -hmm. they, <coughs> excuse me they just needed to turn the screw a little bit mm -hmm. yeah and I mean it, it just didn't yeah it's a uh, it's 
kind of symptomatic of uh, you know our losses last year as well. Where yeah, we, we looked the dominant team, but you know they're able to be very clinical and very direct on uh, you know their chances and able to score from them. And uh, you know we kind of dilly daddle. Maybe we got a little overconfident coming into this match from that Orlando win. Maybe uh, you know we thought that this game was already won. I'm not really sure, but. Um, you know, I, I think from my prediction uh, from last week, I, I mean, I was a little bit worried about this. Uh, and in terms of, you know, everybody likes to talk about, you know, trap games and stuff like that. Uh, this was a classic. It really is, uh, you know, because, you know, they're lower in the standings, but, uh, you know, they have that attack that can really, you know, uh, really worry you. And, you know, like they did, they got a uh, unexpected win against us, you know. But, yeah, um, I mean, the first thing about that part, I mean, it's just like that, it was simple stuff from DC. It yeah. wasn't technical, you know, it wasn't very advanced. It was, we're going to lump it forward mm -hmm. because we're not very good in the middle of the park. They're going to win possession most of the time. Long balls forward, root one stuff that you'd expect from Sam Allardyce or something. Yeah. And it worked. They, they When they got their chances, they had the players and made it United pay. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the most frustrating thing is they didn't do anything overly creative or surprising. Mm -hmm. They just worked harder, even though they had played three games in seven days, and they looked right. like they wanted it more. Right. And Atlanta United didn't put the effort in. Mm -hmm. They didn't come out with the effort required or the, the desire, that spark they needed, whether it be from arrogance or just, no. they just didn't have it. And that's what you get when that happens is you lose 3-1 in, in a fixture that you thought was three points. I right. certainly thought it was three points. And when you watch the game, you can see that Atlanta United was better and it should mm -hmm. have been three points. Right. But, yeah. So it's different. It is, yeah. And so let's get into our other conceded goals, which I think are a little bit uh, preventable. And, um, you know, so let's break these down. And, um, you know, it's uh, after some dominant play, we, uh, you know, we really grown in the game after coming out of the, the half. And, you know, uh, it's just a very unfortunate, uh, you know, on the, on the counter. You know, we uh, we concede the penalty uh, with Barco conceding it against Paul Ariola. So. And yeah, and, and this this goal has a lot to do with poor positioning and bad decision making. Yeah. When the ball is played kind of into the middle part of the pitch, McCain decides to close the ball down, leaving kind of his left back spot area where he would have provided cover to Barco. Unfortunately, now this leaves Barco exposed in a one-on-one -on -one situation against a player who's a winger and not actually a fullback and has the wherewithal to get into the box and to do what he did. That being said, at the penalty itself, I thought it was rather soft. I thought he was yep. going down and he's swinging his foot and he catches Barco. I understand why the penalty was given. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, the referee technically fall, is following the letter of the law and he's mm -hmm. doing a good job and that's fine. It's just frustrating from Atlanta's perspective. But, you know, poor, poor positioning and possibly some bad decision making. Mm -hmm. Again, simple stuff, mental yep. stuff. Right. That's what leads to a goal that, you know, when Rooney steps up, you feel confident in him, in him burying that because mm -hmm. Brad Guzan's stats when it comes to saving penalties uh, are not because he hasn't. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, back to uh, Barco who has been scapegoated, uh, I think, uh, in this match. You know, I don't think he had the best match, but I think also, you know, there are fans that also are uh, ragging on him a bunch. But I think in this, um, you know, him giving up the penalty or conceding the penalty, he never gets goal side against Paul Areola. And, well, to be fair, he's not really a defender as well, and he's also 5'6". Yeah, uh, he's being put into not a great situation. Yeah. He's not exactly a strong person, so he's not going to body right. anyone off the ball. Yeah. So it was just an unfortunate situation. But, you know, I think you're right, because it's like he is being scapegoated um, a little bit. Did he have a bad game? Yeah, yeah, that's fair for people to go on Twitter or, yeah. or to express their opinions and say that he played poorly. I, I thought he had a poor game. Yeah. Yes, did he have an assist? Yeah. yeah. But he aside created from chances, that, he, yes. He did, but... but he also lost the ball. He mm -hmm. missed a couple opportunities himself where he could have scored. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who has a bit more of a striker's instinct maybe wouldn't let that ball just flick off of him. They could have anticipated it and he mm -hmm. could have hit it into an empty net. My biggest issue with him was is the effort wasn't there. I mean, there was a time in the second half where he's, you know, coming towards goal, driving towards goal, loses the ball and just stops running in time. Entirely. The ball is only played a few yards away, and what he should do immediately, especially considering you're trailing, is go and press the ball again, deepen the opponent's half, and force him to make a play where they can give the ball up, pass it back, have a deflection, who knows what can happen. But he doesn't even press, he just stands there and lets DC play out from the back. And it's those effort plays. And then, you know, giving up on a play and leaving LGP in a situation that he's not comfortable with, and he ends up getting booked. 
and LGP is screaming at Barco afterwards. The problem is, it wasn't just Barco that didn't put forth the effort. There was a complete lack of effort and intensity all around the side, you know, minus a few players. I mean, even towards the end, Miguel Almiron still tracking back and winning tackles, mm -hmm. which just speaks to what he does and how much energy, you know, he goes through every game just doing everything. Because exactly. he was doing that all game. You know, Atlanta would lose the ball, and he's smart enough and hardworking enough that he's tracking back immediately, winning the ball in the first three seconds and getting it back into circulation. Mm -hmm. And that's just another incredible thing that Miguel Almiron does that I think sometimes even I slightly overlook is how much work he does off the ball and defensively for a player so gifted going forward. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and so, you know, the uh, the final uh, goal, the the dagger that uh, put away this game for, for DC, um, yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, we push way too far up, uh, but it's, you know, it's a case we're chasing the game. We uh, want to score the, the tying goal. And, I think we also yeah. want to get a winner, which is why they're yeah. being so aggressive so early. They think exactly. that if they can get that equalizer, they can take the lead by keep pushing as well. So. Yeah, it's maybe a bit naive, maybe, but it also, I mean, it, you know, uh, we're, we're the team that, you know, is higher up in the standings. People expect us to, to win this game. I mean, we were always going to push to to score the goals. So uh, we get caught out. You know, Rooney, you know, uh, does what he does and, you know, holds up the ball, gives a beautiful ball uh, to Luciano Acosta. And, uh, you know, Acosta burns Lorenowitz again. And, uh, and burns Brad in again. Yeah, I mean, same type of goals that he scored against us. Uh, every you know, game. Yeah, every almost every single time, uh, you know, that uh, th that they've won. And so it's very annoying, obviously. But, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, if we do see them in the playoffs, like, you know, that this is a worry. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I am They're, legitimately I mean, worried. They were, if, if a team is able to be compact defensively and then score on their chances when they do play direct, they're going to be a dangerous team. That's one of the options against teams like Atlanta. That is a strategy that teams have to take, that most teams take you can do it then you're in a good position especially if you can prevent Atlanta from scoring or if Atlanta's having an off day mm -hmm. which I mean when Joseph Martinez is missing chances like he missed when he was one-on-one -on -one with the keeper yeah. it's like you it just might not be your day right um and that happens in football sometimes and it's just really frustrating when you just don't have your day and the effort's off and it's just it's just one of those games and it's frustrating but you know I'm, I'm more frustrated about the game itself because of where it puts you in, in, in the standings mm -hmm. and the nature of the goals and how sloppy they were that they mm -hmm. gave up. That it was just like, this was a game that they should have won. They should have been, they shouldn't have been looking past because they could have gone ahead of New York on points with the game in hand and given themselves a little bit of a cushion to the Red Bulls for that game that they're going to play later this month. Mm -hmm. And they didn't take advantage of it and they played sloppy. And I think that's the biggest problem for me is not that it happened, but it was just like, mm -hmm. it happened now. You know, your rival just got thumped 3-0 mm -hmm. and you turn around and go and lose 3-1 to a team that you should be beating. Mm -hmm. And you didn't even look like you were going to beat them, you know, when, right. when it comes to the wasting of the chances. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the most worrying and frustrating part about this game itself mm -hmm. is the nature of the goals. And again, you know, the fact that they, they had an opportunity and they missed it. Right, uh, but one thing should be noted, and uh, I think, uh, you know, and you just alluded to that earlier, is that the the pitch did seem to favor uh, DC United's um, you know style way of, of play? Yeah, exactly. And that yeah, I mean you could see the patches on the field where there were pools of water, uh, where you know it was maybe a little oversaturated, and maybe you know I, I saw on Twitter that uh, apparently the grounds crew cut the grass after the match, and so that's pretty ridiculous so long grass thick yeah. pitch waterlogged yeah makes the ball move slower yeah. really convenient when you're playing against a team that moves the ball along the floor also really convenient when all you're doing is lumping it forward 50 yards right. at a time and it's never touching the floor mm -hmm. so yeah i can't say i mean it's, in favor, yeah. it, it's it's gamesmanship and yeah. if i'm dc i'm gonna do the exact same thing against mm -hmm. atlanta united so is it frustrating yeah you better believe it yeah. but well played on DC's part, I guess I have to say. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's smart, um, and it's you know, it's what you got to do if uh, you're you know where you are in the standings. So yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, hope we won't have to but, deal with it again unless we see them in you know the semi conference yeah. semifinals or conference finals. Mm -hmm. So if they have to, you know, on the positive, they can just come to Mercedes Benz and get their butt you know their butt whipped because yeah. right now it doesn't seem like they can win in that place. And mm -hmm. the grass isn't going to be too long, and the ball's right. going to move pretty quick. So it's true, not going to work out for them there. Yeah. Definitely. But uh, yeah, speaking of balls moving quickly, uh, you know, when uh, the uh, the homegrown George Bellow came in, yeah, he was just like, you know. The ball came was, to him right away. Yeah, he was whipping in crosses uh, left and right. Uh, whether they came off or not, 
Uh, really doesn't matter. I mean, it's his MLS debut. Uh, congratulations. This is a pretty good one. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, some of them came on and some, some of them came of them off. Didn't. But again, you know, he's a young kid, homegrown. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to see him in this eye. I thought it was yeah. really cool that he see him get that chance. And when I heard Tata mm -hmm. saying his name to come on, I was just like, wow, this yeah. is this is going to be the situation. And yeah, as I a left think, wing back as yeah, well. Yeah, I think which yeah. would suit him in, mm -hmm. in, in Atlanta's system. Is right. If they want to be more attacking, I'd like mm -hmm. to see more of him to see what he can do. Especially right. if the, you know, the team can get some leads against these teams coming mm -hmm. up on the road in San Jose and Colorado, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to see him play more and see if he can step in and give you an attacking option. Mm -hmm. You don't have to play McCann to maybe give him a little bit of a rest. Right, yeah, no, absolutely having options and having, you know, one more attacking and one more defensive is something that, uh, you know, it's a, it's definitely a blessing for sure. But also, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Tata apparently told him to just, you know, get in there and just, you know, lump as many crosses as you could. and. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the 18 minutes he was on the pitch, um, I would say, yeah, I mean, he, you know, he did his job. He, uh, you know, it is what it is in terms of uh, our, our goals conceded. Like, you know, he, he didn't uh, contribute in a negative way, I think, to our defense. I mean, obviously, I think he, uh, he's a 16-year-old kid. I mean, he's yeah. going to have to uh, grow into his body a little bit more. When He'll he, get uh, a lot better you know, with but, age. But he's yeah. bright, he's a young prospect, yeah. and you can tell that he's confident. Right. That's important. And I yeah. think him getting this game, he'll grow on that, he'll learn from that, and hopefully push forward. And hopefully he could be a left back for Atlanta United for a few good years and then move to Europe if he's good enough. I mean, that's yeah. what you want to see from exactly. these young guys is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give us three, four really good years, help us win right. some stuff, and then if you're good enough, you'll move on. And I think mm -hmm. he is definitely a very, very talented player. Mm -hmm. And I think he's one of those players that Atlanta hope, you know, as a homegrown player, can grow in, yeah. become a solid player, and then get that move over there. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens. We've got a long time before, before that happens. But, you know, congrats to him for getting his debut. That's exactly. just awesome to see that. Atlanta United is having homegrown players playing in the first right. team. For me personally, I love when a club does that. So I Absolutely. think that's really, really cool. Yeah, and it, especially, yeah, he's the youngest ever five stripe to ever play for the club. Um, you know, I, I think that's, you know, awesome. And especially against, you know, uh, I mean, they're, uh, DC United are a team that are vying for the playoffs. And so it's, uh, you know, it was a big circumstance, too. It wasn't like he On was the road garbage in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a hot atmosphere that's right. definitely mm -hmm. wanting you to fail. I mean, right. yeah, yeah, it was it was a big situation. So it right. was good to see that Tata trusted him mm -hmm. in that scenario. Yeah, and it's also interesting, you know, he, in this match, played more than Andrew Carlton maybe got uh, in his first, uh, you know, few games for the, for the club. It's... It's interesting that, uh, you know, maybe he wasn't brought on, but uh, I mean, we had shifted into, I think, a three man in the back with wing backs at that point that uh, I think Carlton, I mean, the only person he would have maybe had to just straight swap with uh, with Tito, I think. But, yeah, but um, I think the situation suited, suited him a lot better. I think so. so I think it worked out in yeah. the sense that he got his debut. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the result didn't. Right. But, you know, it's a good starting point, mm -hmm. something to build on, something to move forward, and I'm right. excited for the kid. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to speak on that, uh, that, um, that strategy that uh, Tato was trying, essentially, I mean, you know, with Romario Williams on and Joseph Martinez both on, uh, they're definitely, you know, betting on route one, essentially. And, um, you know, trying to see if they could win a ball in the box and, you know, go from there. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the question is maybe was that the right tactic? Um, you know, a lot of that gets stale sometimes. And I think it's three one down, though, you have to start being more direct. It's yeah. hard to just play through the, you know, the transitions and the progression. And, right. You know, play out of the back and do all that nice stuff. It's like mm -hmm. once you're three one down, you have to start being more forceful with what you're doing and mm -hmm. have to start pushing numbers forward and hoping that you can get something. Because if you get the one goal, you can get the second, especially with a good right. team like Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I don't think that DC is very good. I think they could have gotten nervy even at home mm -hmm. with the expectation to win. From that position right so you know if you get that second goal then it's fine you yep. know you can really have a lot of options and what you can mm -hmm. do unfortunately it just didn't come so let's get into the quotes from the match and Tata Martino had uh, this interesting thing to say about the penalty uh, he said I was far away so it was hard for me to say but it's possible with the referee we had tonight that it was going to be a penalty yeah, I mean, uh, interesting quote there. Uh, him basically saying that, uh, you know, if it was in the box, it was probably going to be called. Um, although, 
Yeah, I mean, you disagree, I think? Yeah, I, I'm not really... Uh, I love Tata Martino, and if you saw my Twitter feed during the game, you know I love Tata Martino. Yeah. Now I should talk about how much I love him later. Yeah. Uh, but I kind of disagree with him on this one. Um, I, I thought the ref was fair. Um, I thought it was a soft penalty, but I understood why he gave it. Mm. But it wasn't like he was fooled by anything. He gave Rometty a, a booking for simulation, which was absolutely deserved. Mm. And he didn't call the penalty when Rooney went down You know, in the second half. I thought Although that, that could have been simulation. But. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he didn't give the penalties for those incidents. So I don't think he's just giving away penalties left, right, and center. Otherwise, I think I definitely could have seen the Rooney one getting called if he wanted to. Yeah. Um, just because there was contact there. You know, Romani, he definitely threw himself to the floor and doesn't cover himself with any glory in that no. dive. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that he was just going to give away a penalty for any foul in the box. But no. it was soft, I will say that. Yeah. Uh, next quote also comes from Tato Martino, and uh, he talks about the play of Ezekiel Barco, and if there was pressure on him to you know, do really, really well uh, due to his transfer fee. Uh, he says, no, I don't think so. Sometimes guys have the confidence to finish those plays, and sometimes they don't. Especially tonight, I don't think it's anything to worry about with him individually. It was more a collective effort. What we tried to do was to get the ball out wide and get the ball into the box to our forwards in there. They were able to get on the counter a few times, and once they got a third goal, it kind of opened us up. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it's that type of uh, match that Ezekiel Barco, yes, he didn't have the best match. And, um, you know, a lot of the, the players didn't have their best match as well. I mean, but uh, I think there are some glaring points in this match where you could pinpoint uh, a few players that, yes, they could have done better there. Uh, Ezekiel Barco, as you mentioned earlier, Loretta West could have done better, uh, although maybe his foot speed is, you know, just Not lacking great. at this point. Uh, and Acosta, yeah, tore him apart you this match. You have a short, very fast, quick person who can take quick touches. Yeah. Uh, you have Guzan, who, you know, doesn't get down quick enough uh, to, you know, beat those rug burners. Um, you know, uh, Countless, countless times in this match, yeah. I mean, Rometty not being clinical in front of goal. Yeah, he had two sitters, yeah. so let's be realistic. They were yeah. Two sitters. And so, you know, lots of things go going on in this match. It's just like... Nothing yeah. really just broke out his way. Uh, yeah. I mean, Atlanta, you know, that was just one of the few things. Just everything went DC's way. Mm -hmm. They got the bounces when they needed them, and they finished when they needed to. And it's just yeah. a case of Atlanta just didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. that's really what it is. That's the, the biggest thing we can just take away from it at this point. Yeah, and you know, we'll have those games. Every team has those games. Uh, you know, I think we hadn't really uh, taken a, an L in a really long time, and so I don't think there's I mean there hasn't been a loss like that yeah. since I'd say Red Bull because Dallas yeah. was different. Dallas was different. Yeah. That was just mm -hmm. a gut punch late where everything just fell apart. Right. But you mean Red Bull beat Atlanta and Atlanta yeah. didn't play well. Right. And that was the last time, and that was a while back. Yeah. So, I mean, they only have five losses on the season. So it's mm -hmm. it's it's been a while. They had gone to eight and unbeaten. Mm -hmm. That's nice when you do that, because, mm -hmm. I mean, they tend to go on a little run like that every, well, actually quite a bit. Yeah. They, they don't lose too many games. There's a response to adversity, and so that's what you want to see, and hopefully the team does that. Well, I mean, the next uh, game that they have yeah. after the international break, and we'll break yeah. that down, when that you know game week comes around, mm -hmm. is not good. They got six hung on them by Real Salt Lake, who then went and hung six on LA Galaxy, who yeah. were terrible. Right. But, I mean, that's a team where you can get a response. They're very bad. So, we'll see in two weeks' time what everyone does when they come back. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, Atlanta have been very good responding to drop points and especially mm -hmm. losses this season. Yeah. So, we'll see Definitely. what they do when they do that. But, right. yeah, just a flat performance and a frustrating game. But, thankfully, it mm -hmm. happened at the beginning of September and not in the playoffs. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a good time uh, to kind of, you know, Get a lesson it's never a learning. good time, but if yes, there's a good if there a time was. as any, yeah. now is the time. Right, and uh, because, yeah, we still have time to rectify it and then make a little bit of a run going into playoffs, so it's you know better than last year where we sputtered into the playoffs. So uh, hopefully this is that wake-up call that uh, not everything's going to be easy. But, you know, maybe uh, you know maybe it was something that uh, Yamil Assad wasn't in the game. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our man on the inside, wink, wink, um, you know, wasn't playing. And, uh, you know, because, you know, the, the factors, uh, the X factors in the wins, you know, Yamil Assad and no uh, Bill Hamid, is it? Sure. No. Whatever. But uh, <laughs> I guess what I will say, you know, as, as we start coming to the end of the analysis yeah. of the DC game, mm -hmm. I hate DC United. 
yeah. because they annoy the shit out of me. Yeah. And I would absolutely say from one week to the next, mm -hmm. DC is a rival for me. Yep. I really don't like them, and I want to beat them every time we play because of the team. Yeah, yeah, because of the team, because of, you know, um, just... They've beaten United four, Atlanta four out of six times. Yeah, Four exactly. out of six to DC United, mm -hmm. who are not good. Right. Like, they've, I, you know... I don't get it. Of all the, yeah, you know, every team has that kind of bogey team, and they are a bogey team, and, um, you know... Although this is like a kind of 60-40 type of thing right now uh, between us and them. Um, you know, we don't even have like really 50-50 matches. It's, you know, you get... One uh, team wins or the other team wins. Yeah, exactly. Usually 3-1, actually, yeah. or 3-something. So it's, uh, it's a bit, bit ridiculous. But, you know, I think the best thing to come from this match, absolutely, though, still is, uh, you know, just a shining moment from Tata. Oh, yes. You know, and uh, we'll play this here. And, yeah. I mean, essentially... Uh, I love that man. Yeah. I really do. I mean, he endeared himself so much to me. I mean... He's learned some English, uh, you know? Oh, he, I think he knew it the whole time. For sure. uh, you know, he understands pretty much everything. He just chooses... He speaks in Spanish. That's yeah. what he wants to do. But he decided to let his English fly. Right. And, uh, yeah, that's the yeah. one redeeming quality for me because... Mm -hmm. Just love that man. Yeah, and this I was really regarding do. that uh, that non-red call on uh, Miggy being fouled. To and be fair, I didn't think it was a red. Did it? I did think. it? Did it? Did it piss me off? Yes. Yeah. Is it a cynical foul? Yes. It's absolutely he cynical. He doesn't get the ball. He, yeah, you know, but he's, he's not recklessly his endangering leg. his opponent. He's take. He knows oh, what he's man. doing. It's a professional foul, but it, I don't know. It's, it's all not leg. like he, it's not like he's sliding in from the back to break him. I mean, it could but have it's been a, foul a lot from more. behind. Yes, but he's not fouling him. He's not fouling into him from behind. He fouled him from behind, and it wasn't close enough to the goal to be, a, as they're saying now, sure. dogs. Yeah, it's not dogs. You know, but. so I, I thought it was a yellow. It was a hard yellow. That's what it is. That's what it is everywhere else. He wasn't letting Lane out a break. Professional yeah. foul. I wouldn't have given him a red either. To be perfectly yeah. honest. With I you. mean, I, I've seen that uh, be called in, you know, the Premier League, and you know, it's. I don't know. I mean, it's it's one of those. Uh, maybe it's, you know, it's left up to the ref there, but... Further forward and less players behind, I think, yeah. but I didn't think it was nearly violent enough in and of itself to, to, to be a yeah. I think, uh, you know, either way, Tata shows his passion, and uh, that's, you know, in, in this case, in this uh, silver lining of this match, at least we have this. And guys, moving on into the news, Arthur Blank spoke with Doug Robertson of AJC in a nice feature, and uh, he basically said that, you know, he expects LA United to uh, want to get deep into the playoffs, and I think uh, you know it lines up with uh, the ambitions of you know the people that follow the club and also that play for the club. Yeah, I mean he wants to win. Like, let's yeah. be clear about that. You know, he, he he even talks about how you know bringing joy to the community through the team winning, how he wants that, and I think he is very aware of how much Atlanta United has affected this community, mm -hmm. how much of it's grown to become an integral part of this community, and how much winning would mean, especially to the city of Atlanta, which yeah. let's be honest, doesn't win a lot when it comes to sports. Yeah, it's true, and so you know he's worried about more, uh, you know, that it makes people happy versus. Um, he really know. doesn't care about the price. I don't think he cares yeah. about the money at all. Yeah. Like he really doesn't. He just wants to. He 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 actually cares about it. And how he talked right. about it is like, look, this is a club for the community, for the fans, and he wants it to be that way. Mm -hmm. And for me personally, you know, to hear that from an owner is incredible because you don't get that a lot in sports. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm as everyone knows a Man United fan, and I hate the owners of that. Team. I hate the Glazer family. They have a crap team in American football mm -hmm. and the Buccaneers, and they're just making money off the team I love in Manchester United, and I hate them. Meanwhile, at Atlanta United, I have an owner who actually cares yeah. about winning and wants the fans to be happy. That does not happen a lot in sports. Yeah, he's like a good representative of, uh, you know, not just, you know, Atlanta, like for the league and for- Everything. Uh, I mean, everything yeah, he does, owners. he runs, he yeah. runs first class organizations. Exactly. Both the Falcons and in Atlanta United and in the facility he's built in Mercedes-Benz right. Stadium with the friend, you know, the fan-friendly pricing and everything. He's and the training just, grounds. And, and the training yeah. grounds of everything. He cares, yeah. and it's just incredible to have right. from a guy like that. Yeah, building, uh, building, you know, soccer pitches uh, all around uh, Atlanta so that you know the unfortunate uh, people that don't have as many resources can play there. I mean, it's just it's a beautiful thing. So uh, I, I love it that our our owner is you know someone that's exemplary. You know, so um, and moving on to uh, another piece of news, Joseph Martinez uh, very interestingly uh, said 
uh, when asked if uh, you know he had you know just uh, ambitions of returning to Europe, he uh, pretty simply said, "Ask Darren." And uh, you know I think it's uh, you know it basically says yes uh, he's probably you know he has doesn't have the ambition of moving, but if uh, Darren Eels wanted to move him, then you know then that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, I mean for him it's like look. I think he loves Atlanta. I think yeah. he's about to stay here. I think he knows Atlanta United can afford to pay him more. I think you might see him getting a nice contract after the season, possibly, because that's what good teams do when players have seasons like that to keep them happy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you score 35 plus goals, if you're scoring a goal a game and you win a championship, you win an MVP, and you're playing the way you're playing, and you're clearly better than everyone else, big teams are going to come in and look at him. And I think for him, it's going to be. Does the right fit come up for both him and Atlanta United? Does the right price come up? If all those things are met, then yes, maybe Joseph Martinez does go back. And for him, that's awesome. I'd love to see him go back and succeed and do well. Alternatively, I'd like to see him be wearing the five stripes for the end, until the end of his career and for him to keep scoring goals here for the next 10 years. But, you know, it's that's not how it works. Atlanta United yeah. aren't the big club, you know. If teams that are bigger want players and those players are keen to go, they're not going to go. That's yeah. what's going to happen. But... Yeah. We'll see. You know, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, and uh, in a you know, uh, nice segue is that uh, you know uh, Tato Martino also spoke about how he, uh, you know, when he brought the the players over, uh, Miguel Miron and Jose Martinez, he promised them that he would get uh, Miguel Miron to Europe for the first time, also Jose Martinez back to Europe, and so um, you know it's kind of this uh, you know this promise that he's given them that yes he's going to improve them and really. Uh, you know, send them along their way if they so chose that they wanted to go. We all know that Miguel Miron wants to go to Europe uh, for the first time. He hasn't experienced uh, it like Jose Martinez has. Jose Martinez has a different experience, obviously, and um, you know where he was treated unfairly, probably by uh, Torino fans, and uh, wasn't played in the best positions that he wanted to play in. And he just you know, wasn't very successful. Yeah. He wasn't great in the chances that he did get, and, mm-hmm. and that's how football works. Sometimes you mm-hmm. need the right you know, mix that right chemistry for a player to be successful. And he's gotten that in Atlanta, I'd mm-hmm. say. So, you know, who knows what the future holds, but mm-hmm. Tata's going to do his best, and that's admirable. I would expect that from the manager, and he's honest with the players, and he's straightforward with the players, and that yeah. drives the players. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd love nothing more than to see these guys playing for the big teams in Europe that I don't hate, so as long as they don't go to Liverpool, or Manchester City, or Chelsea, or PSG, or Real Madrid. Aside from those clubs, um, it's a yeah. lot of clubs, though, man. It's All right. fine. Yeah, well, we won't get into that. Yeah, Not yeah. in this. Different, different subject, different yeah. day. I hate those teams. <laughs> uh, moving on, it's a uh, you know international window now, and you know. Uh, I don't know why. Are... I'm gonna be perfectly honest. <laughs> like, I get yeah. they have like the whole Nations League thing yeah. now, whatever that is, FIFA. Yeah. There was literally a World Cup less exactly. than two months ago. Why is there an international break right yep. now? It makes no sense. Like, literally, yeah. after the World Cup, there should be no international duty for the rest of that year. I'm like, calendar <laughs> year, you don't need it. It I mean, just yeah. ended. Start it new in the next year. Start it in February or March, whatever, and then get it going. They don't need it playing. They just had a massive There's tournament. a lot of qualifications that go into the next tournament. I well, don't not, so. care. Yeah, it's stupid. Know. The I World agree. Cup I just agree. ended, especially yeah. once it gets even bigger. Yeah. I don't need that much. The leagues are fine. I don't care about international soccer outside of that. Plus, there's titles to win, and I don't need players getting hurt for meaningless games. Sure. Uh, But yes, uh, nonetheless, Jose Martinez and Romario Williams have been called into international duty for their respective countries, uh, for Venezuela and Jamaica, of course. I care a lot more about one than I do the other. (laughs) But uh, yeah, and so, but they won't miss any games because you know uh, our next game is in two weeks essentially. So um, you know, it's uh, all all it is is a you know kind of hope that they come back healthy and really. It's I really don't want to play. For. Like if he does <laughs> not play, that'd be great. Yeah. If play, I really am scared for him. Yeah. No. And because uh, they crocked him last year, I want to point that out. Venezuela crocked him last year. Yep. And swear down, if they do, I yeah. that country has enough bad problems. I'm not going to say anything, but like, if uh, they play any any cow pastures again, I mean, I'm yes, going to be just, upset. But, I, just play yeah. somewhere nice. <laughs> take good care of him. He's yeah. a national treasure. They need him as much as we do, yeah. but just not for this. Yeah, like just true, true. the one game. I know one of the games is a qualifier. Play him limited minutes. The other one doesn't mean anything. So the qualifier, play him. That's fine. The one that doesn't mean anything, please don't play him. Yeah, just not at all. Just don't do it. Yeah. 
And uh, so also Tito Bijalba has uh, been, uh, you know, getting his uh, nationalization for Paraguay, uh, for a switch from Argentina to Paraguay. And, uh, you know, now it's completed. And so uh, as of Tuesday night, uh, it was uh, it was done and he's eligible to be called up for the national team now. So that's good for him. Um, maybe I think he'll if he get can some improve play. and play, yeah. I think he has an absolute chance to make the, the very yeah. squad. We should see him yeah. obviously teaming up with Miguel Almiron. Mm -hmm. That would be a lot of fun for Atlanta United fans. I think, you know, if you see Paraguay and both of them are on it playing in, you know, a cotton ball competition or the World Cup for some reason, I'll be pulling for Paraguay, 100% yeah. because of those players. Agreed, agreed. And uh, also, uh, a couple of homegrowns, Andrew Carlton and Chris Goslin, also got called up for the U.S. men's our U.S. youth national team. And uh, yeah, I mean, they'll be playing in different age groups, so it's this kind of uh, tournament that they actually might play against each other, which is interesting. So I don't understand yeah. these international break tournaments for these U20 and U19 and U17 yeah. teams. There's just so many teams, I can't keep track of it. Especially anything with the USMNT right now, I just don't care because it's such a nightmare. Do we sure. even have a coach permanently? I don't think we do. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, yeah, what's happening? Yeah, but uh, Atlanta wins. That's what I care about. <laughs> well, congratulations to all of them, and hopefully they all come back healthy. Because Especially, yeah, everyone, please. We need the depth. We Everywhere. need everybody. Uh, but moving on into Atlanta United two, Lagos Kunga, another homegrown, uh, scored a brace against Toronto FC two. And um, yeah, and we got our first road win of the season for Atlanta United too. And that's uh, good things to build on, uh, especially yeah. I mean, uh, Toronto FC, you know, uh, kind of one of our. At least I don't the, like them either. You know, so, at, yeah, at least one of the beating uh, them at any level makes me happy. Yeah, <laughs> mostly because we haven't done it yet. Just a bunch of two-two yeah. -two draws. Mm -hmm. I don't like Toronto. Yeah. I really don't like Toronto. Yeah. Mostly because their players are dickheads. That Very really true. has a lot to do with it. Very true. But moving on from that, guys, we're going to get into the standings, and I've already kind of touched on it. I'm kind of pissed because it was a great weekend until it was a terrible weekend. New York Red Bull got smacked 3-0, which I thought, all right. And I tweeted out, I said, this could be a massive month for Atlanta United after they lost 3-0. It's like they can win this game against DC, win their game in hand, go five points clear of Red Bull, going into that game where if you win, it becomes eight, you pretty much lock yourself for supporter shield lose it, you still have your destiny in your hands because you're two points ahead. And then we drop the points. And also Red Bull managed to clinch a playoff spot, which is just stupid that they clinched it before Atlanta did, but whatever. But they're on 55 points. We are on 54 points. We're one point off from where we were last season. We played 27 games. You have two very, very winnable games coming up before they get back to Mercedes-Benz for that game against a very resurgent and very strong Real Salt Lake team. So that's going to become a massive game. But as of right now, they're in second. They have that game in hand. If they win that game in hand, they'll go two points clear of Red Bull. But when it comes to game in hands, we know it means nothing because Red Bull didn't win their games in hand, which is why we are where we are. NYCFC are still in third place, but it is very much turning into a two-horse race at the top with basically the decider coming down to that match at the end of this month in New Jersey against the New York Red Bull. Yes, indeed, indeed. And so, guys, we're moving on to our goals and saves of the month. And uh, yeah, I think it's a little bit more interesting race for uh, who wins. There are some good goals Bolton. this month. Yeah, absolutely, especially with the Tito Mazy run. Oh, that's a that's a big Nicky contender. shot, top bends. Yes, indeed. The Joseph shot from outside, well, inside the box, whatever yes. you want to call it, yeah. with a left foot. Right. And not to mention that little matter of that goal down in Orlando where he did that certain thing. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So you know, he uh, Joseph Martinez broke. Uh, you know the. The single season goal scoring record. There we go. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, with that meaningful goal, uh, I mean, it has to be, you know, I think it's a one in one A. Uh, because, I mean, as in terms of maybe the aesthetic of the goal, uh, yes, it's, you know, beautiful to. Uh, to chip Bendik and you know to just Stare. destroy some uh, of the all stairs these stairs uh, just defenders. amazing and then the yeah. jersey hold up like he's messy around yeah. and he just chip oh yeah. it was just but uh it was Tito Vijalba's uh amazing run as well also I think is that oh, yeah. one A that I mean. got snubbed in a very stupid way for goal yeah. of the week. Agreed. Because agreed. that goal was incredible. He ran so far and made the entire defense look silly, and exactly. then had the composure to finish it. Yeah. That goal was incredible. But I don't want to take anything away from Joseph's goal. You know, left-footed yeah. curl as well, because that was a hell of a goal. Yeah. And then this nice little setup for Miggy to finally bang one yeah. from outside of them. I mean, yeah. this was a month where it was like there are some good goals for sure. But at the end of it, for me, 
it's got to be the one that breaks the record. It's got to okay. be that goal against Orlando yeah. because just the composure mm-hmm. and the cheekiness and the chip and then just the stare down at the end of it. Mm-hmm. It was everything you could ask for in a goal. It was perfect. It was Joseph Martinez mm-hmm. personified into one goal. Yeah. And for me, it's goal of the month. Yeah. And to set the record, no less. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and for uh, saves of the month. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, it's a pretty clear cut one this time. Yeah. I think uh, it's that save against Orlando. Orlando uh, by Guzan and point blank so fast the yeah. reaction on that and exactly he, and he needed to make that save after that you know they didn't really have too much going towards the goal so yeah. that was key in, in getting that 2-1 result so that, yeah. that for me it's got to be that one as well it was a hell of a save although he made quite a good one that we might see for save of the month for yeah. September against DC unfortunately it came in a loss yeah true 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 but uh guys let's get into your mailbag <laughs> questions you send in these questions in IG story and uh, you know please keep sending those in uh, we really appreciate that but the uh, first question comes from Gray Barbie he asks should we sign a fullback as a placeholder with all the injuries we have now I'm assuming that you're thinking that Gressel isn't up to par or something I'm not really sure because uh, I mean Gressel is playing right back and uh, in terms of uh, also, you know, we're out of the transfer window, and so we can't really sign anybody unless they're a free agent. And so, there's not really I, I don't. I, I think United are fine right now. You got Bello on the left who made his debut. He's going to push forward and continue to do well. You have Gressel who's shown what he can do on the right. I think you know the DC game. Let's just forget about it. Let's move past it. It's in the past. It wasn't a good game. I think him playing right back is still the right way forward, especially while Escobar's out, especially with teams we should beat. And I think you might start seeing Bello on the left even more. So I think that you've got two guys that have emerged that can give you that cover in those positions. Obviously, you'd like for your depth to come back a little bit, but Escobar should, you know, the international break comes at a good time for him to get fit. So if they want to slide him back into right back, I wouldn't do it against Colorado because I think they're terrible and we can score a lot of goals. So, but I think against maybe a team like RSL, at home maybe you don't want to be that aggressive when you put Escobar back in so we'll see I think I don't think there's much to worry about at this point you've seen two guys show that they can play that position more so Gressel less so Bello but you know what you're going to get I think he can play more and so yeah I don't think we need to sign anyone I think we'll be all right yeah uh next question comes from Aaron Frazier with three R's if DC never had Rooney would Atlanta have had a better chance of winning yeah. I mean, I mean, obviously he pulled the strings and yeah. they won, but who's to say we still struggled against them last season? I mean, obviously they're worse without him. He has been Absolutely. a very welcome addition to not just DC, but to the league. He's, you know, far up, you know, put forward what I thought he would do in, in what his return has been so far for mm-hmm. DC. So, you know, maybe, yeah. yeah, but it's just football. You know, right. who knows? They, they got their tactics right. We played bad. We right. could have played bad without Wayne Rooney, and they still could have won. So, mm-hmm. who knows? Obviously, he pulled the strings in this game, mm-hmm. but we'll never know, I guess. Yeah. Uh, next question comes from Nichols at night. After this loss in particular, I feel like we miss Nagby, and he's the key to success in the postseason. Do you agree? Uh, it's a tough, tough to say. I mean, I think, you know, uh, yeah, Nagby, his importance uh, can't be understated. Obviously, he, you know, holds possession for us very, very well. He... Uh, you know, in the final third, really ha- makes a very incisive pass uh, a lot of the time. Um, yeah, I mean, but in terms of maybe goals and assists, he's not always filling it up in the stat sheet. Uh, and we've struggled against uh, some of the, you know, teams that have parked the bus. And, you know, so it's, you know, I, I think he's a big factor, but I think in terms of him being the sole key. I think it's not quite that. Yeah, I mean, I think in some statistical categories, people might think he's been slightly disappointing at times this year. But, I mean, he's such an important player that does dictate play, that you can't get off the ball, that helps when you're in recirculating in that possession. I think the team wasn't playing at its best when he was playing. So I think that if he comes back into a side that's playing well, I think he fits really well into a 4-3-3 on the, on the right side. If Miguel Amaral is on the left, I think it gives him a lot more space to work with and a lot more involvement. Um, so we'll see what happens when he gets back. But, I mean, obviously when you're missing a player of his quality and everyone knows how good he is on the ball, you know, you're going to be like, well, we could have been better with him. But sometimes he just hasn't done the things we've needed him to do, and it's been a whole team thing. They've struggled against his style of play all season. And, you know, hopefully, well, they won't really see them much in the playoffs, I don't think, because those teams will be better. But those teams will also be more organized. So 
we'll see what happens. But I, I don't think we can point to one player missing as the reason why. But I think it would have helped had he been there for sure. Right. Definitely, definitely. Uh, next question comes from Benigno99. He asks, should Barco be benched? I think it's a bit uh, harsh. No, uh, I'm going to yeah. say no. And I've, I'm not one to shy away from criticizing players. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think he's been good enough this season. Um, I think that he let himself down, obviously, with, with the issues off the field. And I thought he had a bad game. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know who's going to start over him. I think he's still better than Carlton. Um, I still think he has more upside than Carlton, as good as Carlton is. I mean, you don't pay $15 million for a young person unless you think they're pretty good. Mm-hmm. So I think he's still got a lot to improve. Um, and he frustrates the hell out of me sometimes, to be perfectly honest. But he's shown you the talent at times. He's shown you he can score good technical goals. And he's shown you that when he plays well, he really helps his team. Um, unless you're planning on changing the formation or moving someone else, I mean, maybe you can move an Almiron up there if you play a 4-3-3 and keep her many and, and Nagby in midfield when Nagby gets back. But there's a lot of moving around you can do. I would not drop him personally. I would not bench him. I think he needs to play. Whether you want to keep him or whether you're trying to sell him, he has to play in order for you to get either one of those things done. So for me, no, he, he plays. Yeah, I agree. Uh, next question comes from Nick Lanfear. I think we kind of answered it uh, above uh, in nah, just, previously, but... I feel you on the emojis, man. Yeah, man. Just, you know, if it is what it is. Uh, next question comes from Ashley Meyer 9 Do you think we should send the ball straight in from corners more? Yes. I yeah. like it. I mean, I think that we take mm-hmm. way too many short corners to begin with. True. Um, sometimes being too technical and crossing the ball into the box, like, just put the damn thing in there and see what happens. Mm-hmm. I mean, sometimes it's gets against teams that aren't very good defensively and with keepers who aren't very good. That's what's going to get you a goal sometimes. That's true. But uh, to know why we you know play short corners so often is that, yeah, we're not exactly the tallest no. team, and so we don't want to be caught out on counters. So uh, There is a danger when you put the ball in the box. Yeah. Because if the keeper does claim it or if someone can get it clear, teams can break really, really quickly. Right. And if all your defenders and all your big guys and quick people are in and around the box, it can leave you exposed. Yeah. Um, you know, I still think we should do it more often just to test teams. Yeah. But I think mixing it in with the short corner routines that Atlanta does have mm-hmm. is the way just to keep teams unbalanced and, and yeah. you know, and on their toes. On exactly. their toes, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So next question comes from Camden R. Schwederman. He asks, "Why do you think Tata took Barco and Vijalba off when we were down?" I think Barco because he was having a terrible game, and I think Tito because he was exhausted. I think yeah. those are he runs himself ragged every He runs match. himself into the floor, and yeah. you can see that at the end of the game that he's put a shift in. Mm-hmm. I think he tried, and just stuff wasn't coming off for him, and he, he was knackered. And I think with Barco, it's because he wasn't trying, and yeah. he wasn't very good. So yeah. that made sense for me. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I, I hear the criticism of uh, Romario Williams, and, you know, you guys don't think he does enough. Uh, but he's also getting the instructions from Tato Martino. He's not starting these matches, and so... Yeah, he I mean, doesn't play a lot. And yeah. to be fair, when you have a striker in front of you like Joseph Martinez mm-hmm. and you only have 34 league games, you're not going to play a lot. Right. So it's frustrating from him. And people, I think, really need to understand his perspective on things where he doesn't get a lot of games. Yeah, training is fine. You train. Mm-hmm. But getting match time with the first team, with your teammates, mm-hmm. he doesn't get a lot of. And that's very difficult. And it's very difficult to come on as a sub when you're losing to get into the flow of the game, get touches, and be able to make a difference. That's a very difficult thing to do. It's not just like, oh, I'll come on and I'll do well now. Soccer's not basketball. You can't just have the ball immediately and you can just drive. There's, It's a lot harder to break things down. So he's not always in a great position and he hasn't played enough to you know, really make a difference. So I think people definitely need to cut him some slack and understand you're putting on an out and out striker. You're down three goals to one. You do that. I would have made the exact same sub Mm -hmm. every single time I would have brought him onto the game. So it just, it is what it is. I thought Tata was right in the substitution of this game. I thought those are the two players that needed to make way. Yeah. And maybe, you know, he's not being played to his strengths. It is what it is. I mean, it's, you know, we're not going to cater to our backup striker. I mean, it's it's kind of, you know, it's it's symptomatic of that. Yeah. uh, Last question comes from Joey Macchio. He asks, is it just me or does Barco never take shots? He always has a good look, then passes. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, yes, he, you know, doesn't always shoot when we want him to shoot. Uh, yes, it's not always, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, he doesn't have a ton of goals on the tally this year. I mean, uh, I think it is what it is. I mean, you know, he's a a 19-year-old kid that, 
Um, you know, it's not part of his absolute game to, you know, to shoot from everywhere in the box. He's more of that kind of um, creator type of player and that, you know, is, uh, you know, once he kind of grows into his game a little bit more, maybe he adds in more goals, but as of right now, he's just not that type of player. I think the biggest issue for Barker right now is the fact that he doesn't look up when he dribbles. Miguel Almiron does the same thing, but when Miguel Almiron's sprinting, it's usually in a breakaway situation. Barco just looks down, takes these short, tiny touches, doesn't see what he's doing, dribbles himself into, you know, three guys sometimes and loses the ball, or is dribbling down, and because his head's down, he doesn't see the fact that he has a chance for a shot, or he doesn't see the chance that he has an option for an incisive pass. I think right now, his, his biggest issue is he's just not looking up, and to be a playmaker, you need to be able to look up and see the field when you're dribbling. So I'd say that's where he's at right now. It's kind of frustrating personally that a player of his caliber is still doing this, but he's 19. He's going to get better. He's going to grow. But I agree with you. Yeah, no, I think that he has chances, but he's just not taking them. But again, 19 years old, away from home, lots of stuff going on, both on and off the field. I mean, he's going to have some growing pains at times. I'm so hopeful that he can develop into a great player, but you have to give him time. It's not an easy scenario. So... We'll see what happens. He's got a good coach. Hopefully, Tata can get his arm around him, get him on track, and get him fired. Mm -hmm. And uh, that moves us into our Waste Man of the Week this week. And yes, we it's got? actually a very odd Waste Man of the Week this week. My Waste Man of the Week goes to whoever it is on DC staff that pissed Tata Martino off. Um, I don't know who it is. They haven't said who it is. I never expect to find out who it is, but I don't like DC. So whoever it is on their staff, that person's the Waste Man because they managed to pry the Papa Bear that is Tata Martino with his sweater on his back, looking, you know, not aggressive at all. He's best dressed, he's there to impress, and they managed to piss him off. And he fired back, like we said earlier, with the greatest retort ever. I love that man, but I never would have gotten to experience that if it wasn't for the shithousery of whoever the Waste Man was on DC United. But to that Waste Man, I do say thank you, because you gave us gold and you made me happy. So, you're a Waste Man, but thanks. And guys, Ezekiel Barco is definitely a hot topic of conversation right now with opinions from all sides of the spectrum and people hopping to his defense, to his criticism. We just want to hear from you guys. We're just going to keep it simple right now. Is Ezekiel Barco worth the money? Get down in the comments below and let us know what you think. We'll have a look. We'll read them. Looking forward to what you guys have to say because, yeah, it's divisive. It's sure. interesting. We'll see where it goes. Definitely. But guys, that's it for us today. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Share this video because it really does help us a lot. And smash that like button for us. And for Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ. Thank you guys so much for watching.